step behind the camera and welcome to the eye photography podcast so welcome along uh, back to the second episode of our little mini series um and today myself and this is Stephen, by the way if you've not uh, listened to the eye photography podcast before and i've got nick hunt with me haven't we yes yeah i'm back again hi hello everyone Lovely. And yeah, if you haven't caught the previous episode, um, then please do so because it kind of maybe makes a little bit more sense to the, the timeline of what we're doing here with our mini series about the history of photography. I say our first episode about that was all about the technologies of, of cameras and how they've evolved yeah. from like what, well, more than 500 years ago, isn't it really? Yeah. We were oh, yeah. It was kind a of a long way. <laughs> prehistoric photography <laughs> prehistoric. but now <laughs> we're almost yeah, we're yeah. moving into something a little bit more um social in terms of the movements of photography because again like with society photography changes to kind of catch up with the medium and the modes of things that are going on um so so nick is a kind of a brilliant person for this because this is something that you've studied for a long time hasn't isn't it yes yeah yeah um i used to teach history of art and design not specifically photography but history of art and design but obviously as a photographer that was kind of you know very much part of it and i also taught on a photography course so it all kind of linked up together so i've done a fair bit of research got a good background in in art history generally uh, which is useful because it kind of links in with photography I mean it, you know photography I think is part of the history of art really yeah but last week we last time we looked at um the technology really didn't we we looked yeah. at the development of photographic technology uh, right the way through from its early beginnings right the way through to, to well almost to the present day we kind of stopped at digital because like where do you go from there because that's where we, <laughs> we are did the discuss moment. the future didn't we, we did yeah yeah yeah. we <laughs> had a few one. ideas that's like. it a bit black mirrors didn't it it went a bit yeah. dark <laughs> oh yeah it was uh so this this podcast we want to try and link uh the development of the technology with the actual you know actual photography and uh the way photography is used uh different movements in photography uh the way it was seen creatively or as as a job as well you know and socially so there's a lot of different as aspects to photography that we want to try and sort of pull together and then i think next week we're going to look at specific uh photographers yeah. that again link into these different movements in photography so um it, it would just seem more manageable than trying to do everything all in one like oh, mega yeah. podcast which yeah, i don't like think would have three four hours long mm. it would be uh, like, oh, a, like yeah. a documentary yeah. but well, well starting on the the kind of the themes of uh, movements of technology uh, sorry movements of photography um you know as we discussed last week we did it in like a timeline effect yeah. going all the way back what what would you kind of say is like that first movement that first kind of uh, social peak you know of where people start to recognize photography as an art form um, oh God, there's so many different times of, you know, in, in terms of a timeline, obviously it all links in with the way people could capture an image. So what, if you think about camera obscuras and the way they were used to capture and translate an image into a painting. So Renaissance painters were using camera obscuras uh, to get perspective right. So if, if you think of that as the, the original camera and how that altered the way that we see things and look at things through perspective. Uh, I think that's quite an interesting point. And then obviously the first um, actual images were photograms kind of made on leather, but they were just shadow images. They weren't really photographs as we know them now. And it wasn't really until, uh, what's his name? Uh, Nisef Paul. <laughs> I can yeah, we, we, it. we got that. I struggled last <laughs> yeah. week, but I know. Ni Nisef yeah. Niepsi, is it? Yeah, oh, that's uh, how we'll go with that. I like it. we go it. with that? It was a good pronunciation. I think yeah. better, than I, better than I could kind of get to as well. But, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So he, he, he made the first paper negatives and heliographs, which were the forerunners of daguerreotypes and calotypes. So those were the first photos. But obviously, it was a very, very specialized area. And I don't think at the time it wasn't, you know, they could never have imagined what it was going to turn into these days. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, then the daguerreotypes came out. And I think that's the first time that we actually see uh, photography as we know it now. Um, but obviously with the, you know, uh, it, it, it had a limited kind of impact on society at that time, but the portrait became really popular and it was the daguerreotype portraits that really sort of uh, were the beginnings of photography as we know it. 
because they were, you know, they could replace. I mean, up until then, you could only you could only have a portrait painted, couldn't you? So well, people that's used, the, yeah. The interesting yeah. aspect is that yeah, prior to that, the only way to be able yeah. to capture somebody's likeness was through painting, and yeah. obviously, it's not. Um, as we would say, like nowadays, photorealistic. So they're all impressions, of which photography is anyway, but a photography can be very literal. Um, so it was quite interesting that, you know, some of the earliest subjects of those daguerreotypes uh, were people. Um, you know, yeah. it was there was the opportunity straight away to be able to capture an, an image of self and, and have something there as a memory yeah. for, for years. And it was commercially successful as well. I mean, people, I think, as with anything, as soon as somebody thinks you can make a bit of money out of it, suddenly <laughs> it, it, it sort of takes a leap forward, doesn't it? So uh, people cottoned on to the fact that there was a way of producing portraits for people that didn't require the skill of an artist, uh, but they obviously still required a lot of skill in terms of uh, creating these images. And you had to have... That they had sort of like rooftop studios, so you could have the maximum amount of light, but you still had, uh, you know, exposures uh, were over, you know, over a minute or so, even you know, at the most advanced. I mean, the first photos could take hours to 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 appear, but those were very early experiments. When by the time daguerreotypes came along, it was just you know a minute or so, but still, you had to keep still for a minute yeah. uh, in bright sunlight in a huge amount of heat and with the amount of clothes that people used to wear they must have been sweating away there <laughs> with, a, with a clamp on their head to stop them moving to stop them so. moving yeah that's the <laughs> irony i've, I've yeah. seen lovely yeah, yeah. little uh, <clears throat> kind of photo series of uh, Victorian couples, you know, sat together, yeah. um, you know, over multiple exposures because they're having to yeah. sit, as you say, for a minute or two. And that's really hard. Yeah. And you're not really meant to be blinking yeah. either because then that can always yeah. add a little bit of blur. Yeah. So you try that yourself to sit still for, for you know, a minute or two without doing yeah. anything. Um, they went through a lot, but, you know, that's how, I say desperate, but that's how kind of, um, you know, uh, how trendy photography seemed at that time and how how much people wanted to kind of get yeah. involved and have themselves captured. And and therefore, because of the skill, the talent, the equipment that's all needed to, to create those images through the daguerreotypes or whichever type of photography they were using, it was really um, something more so initially kind of uh, sought out by the rich, really, wasn't it? it was yeah. I, I, well, I think, you know, probably I... My impression is that wealthy, really wealthy people probably still had their portraits painted because uh, it was more prestigious to have a painting done of you. But the middle classes uh, who couldn't afford um, portraits to be painted of them could get the daguerreotypes made then. Mm. And it was still expensive, but it was accessible. And uh, I think it was also, I mean, the unfortunate thing was that it they, they couldn't like um make you look any nicer than you actually looked was with a painting you could be painted to look uh you know blemish free uh you know beautiful portrait yeah. of somebody uh you can't do that with a daguerreotype well, well, there was no it. retouching the, the, yeah. the um the quality mm -hmm. of the image i suppose yeah. you know, compared to what they are now um yeah, yeah you were literally showing warts and all it in that yeah. instance really but people were, were you know were, were kind of really keen on having that you know yeah. regardless yeah. in a way as you say but it, over time it, it became more um as you say, widely accessible, uh, you know, that, that lower classes, you know, uh, were able to kind of get involved yeah, and yeah, yeah. start to use it in, in different yeah. ways. But, you know, that's a little bit further Well, later ahead. on, they brought in um, tin types and uh, what were they called? Amber types, which um, yeah. were like much cheaper versions of uh, the daguerreotype, which became popular much later. Uh, and they became much more accessible, uh, you know, on a, for a wider market. But they they were always seen as like second rate and that daguerreotypes were not fashionable anymore. So tintypes and ambrotypes were like, you know, they weren't, you know, they were what you, you had done if you couldn't afford the other, the other sort of processes that were available yeah. at the time. But at the same time as daguerreotypes, you had um, Henry Fox Talbot, had uh, he'd invented his color type process, which is very different because you created a negative and you made a print from that negative. The problem with those were that they were um, they weren't very sharp and clear, um, but they were much more. Um, let me say you could. They were popular with um, amateur photographers and hobbyists, and they enabled you know something you could do with 
readily accessible materials you could buy the chemicals you could set up a dark room and you could become you know an amateur photographer yourself which mm. is something you couldn't really do with daguerreotypes because it was almost an industrial process yeah uh, so um the um calotype became something that uh encouraged uh i'd say amateur and enthusiast photographers who were really the ones who drove the creative element of photography at that time that um the daguerreotypes weren't creative. You were just wheeled in front of the camera, clamped into position. They're very stiff. They're not, the only artistic element might have been, you know, a potted palm tree or a table or something, you know, and <laughs> well, a painted yeah, backdrop. Right. But because um, of the ability that, that, you know, the yeah. camera became a bit more widely available and photographers, you know, as, yeah. a, as a creative uh, individual, we, we started yeah. to appear more so, let's say, like, you know, like rabbits in a field. Yeah. Um, it gave people the opportunity to make photographs their own. So things like yeah. abstract photography or surrealism, et cetera, as well, that began to be explored a little bit yeah. more. Later on, later on, there were so many different movements. I mean, the first book, the first photographic book, was uh, published in 1844, which was Fox Talbot's Pencil of Nature. Uh, but each each plate, each photographic plate had to be a, an actual photographic print because there was no way of reproducing uh, photos in print. At that time, what they used to do, um, they'd send out photographers, like they'd, they'd take daguerreotypes of exotic scenes in far off countries. They'd come back with them, but then they'd have handmade engravings taken from them. So they were engraved by hand for printing in books, but they weren't actual photos yeah. uh, because you couldn't reproduce a photo. It wasn't until I think half tone printing came along a fair bit later that they were able to actually print and make photographic books. And there were other other methods of re reproduction that gave you really good quality uh, images that could be used. But but originally they had to be sort of individual photos that were then glued into a book afterwards, which is the way um, uh, Fox Talbot published his. And at the same time, so this was in the 1840s, 1850s is when the first the first photographic exhibition apparently was held in 1852 in this country. Oh, right. And led to the formation of the Royal Photographic Society in 1853, uh -huh. which was when photography began to be taken seriously, I guess, mm. as as an art as such, or, you know, something that could be exhibited. So print started to be exhibited then. So uh and then in the 1850s, you had other developments, uh, the, the sort of collodion wet plate process and then dry plates afterwards that allowed much more um, creative freedom and other subjects to be approached. So it wasn't just portrait and landscape. Um, and also people started, uh, so, I mean, we'll talk about photographers in, in the next podcast. So they're not, not necessarily mentioning any names or going into detail here. But there were new ideas about photography and what what it was for and how uh, you know what a photo, what a photo was. Uh, so you had different art movements influencing photography. So I think the first types of photography of that type was known as high art photography, which kind of ate paintings of the time. And that was actually the first time you had people doing composite images. So it's kind of like early Photoshop, really, well, in yeah. some ways. It's so true that it, 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 you're <clears throat> right. You know, a lot of people, well, I say a lot of people, some people see Photoshop and editing and all that, you know, as, as yeah. a bit of a crime against purist photography. But the, the photography has never been pure in that sense, really. No, there's been movements for purism in photography, movements for much more creative experimental photography, um, so many different ways of doing it. Um, like I say, the high art photography was kind of like end of the um, 19th century, really. So it's sort of mm -hmm. 1890s, 1880s, 1890s, uh, when photographers, they, they, they were expected to uh, the subject matter would have a narrative or it'd be based on a Shakespeare play or it'd be a biblical scene or uh, it, it was that kind of thing. So yeah. you had had that kind of, and it referred to Victorian high art as well, which is very much the same, lots of romantic subjects from romantic novels, history, uh, mythology. So those are the subjects that, that, that these photographers explored using the new sort of uh, processes that you could actually do at home. Yeah. So you had people could set up their own dark room studio, 
they'd use large plate cameras uh, because that's what you had to use for collodion wet plate. And so, then dry plates came along and made it more accessible. But um, yeah, so there was a lot of experimentation. I think for me, end of the 19th, early 20th century was a really kind of exciting time because there was so much experimentation going on mm. and different photo photographic movements. Well, that's it kind of moving into the, the, the 20th century, the earlier 20th century, because obviously, like you said, the, there was a lot of people recreating, you know, modern, you know, what we see as classic pieces yeah. of art, etc. Yeah. When did it kind of become that people were using the camera really for, you know, very very kind of maybe unusual processes what we may maybe look at as like surreal or abstract photography or conceptual photography did that begin yeah. kind of early early 20th well, century well you had you had that high art photography at the end of the 19th there was a reaction to that at the same time which was sort of naturalism which was the first time people took the camera and 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 you know the photographic process as being more important than trying to make an image looked like something else. Mm. So it was the first time that people had the idea of taking photos that were true to life. So landscapes that should be true to life and that a photo should kind of reproduce what you see with the eye. Whereas, um, so it was the idea of, use, that's when they started using depth of field and vignetting in photos because they said that, it was the idea that this was more natural because when you focus on something, you only focus on one thing, everything else is out of focus. Whereas um, before that, it was accepted that because a camera can make everything in focus, that's how it should be. So the idea of how you use a camera changed and mm -hmm. obviously technology helped with that with lenses and the equipment that people use. Uh, but it was basically using the inherent qualities of the camera and the process became more important. Uh, yeah. subject matter obviously important as well but it, it they moved away from those sort of like historic scenes and narrative scenes to things that were much more naturalistic and also mm. documentary taking photographs of uh you know the, the the natural landscape the people working in the landscape there was you know this is where we saw the beginnings of war photography yeah uh, documentary photography travel photography uh because it became yeah. more portable and with dry plates this became even more so because you didn't have the worry of having to have a whole dark room portable dark room that you took well, around you you're, well, you're totally right as you say mm. because now the cameras started to become more um yeah you, you, i said they were smaller they were more compact i know we talked in our last episode about the kind of the kodak roll film yeah. started coming out yeah, around yeah. about the early 1900s so yeah you're right that i was just going to ask about documentary photography that probably isn't a, a time that it's starting to become more popular that the camera was being used to capture real events and the news in effect could be become more instant and more reactive you could go to a war you could be someone like robert kappa yeah. you could capture these events and bring yeah. the images back and it's not just a case that you were looking at words in a newspaper anymore mm. you'll now be given a, 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 an image as you say because of the quality now a realistic image you know with with depth and with texture and with detail and a little bit more focus so people oh, yeah. can actually see yeah. what was going on yeah. this is like the first time that you're not relying on on hearsay you're actually being able to see the moments that people are talking about which is, is kind of quite a moving thing yeah yeah i mean you know uh, war was documented from right you know right from the crimean war but obviously most people didn't have access to those images because they couldn't be you know they weren't printed in magazines then like you say later uh with modern developments uh and you know photographers like robert kappa and don mccullen and people like that uh those had massive impact those sort of images uh but it's something that i mean most of these kind of I guess most of the themes in photography all started off fairly early in the 19th century. I, mm. I didn't realize that Dr. Bernardo's homes actually uh, used like social documentary photos to, to mm. you know, promote their homes by photographing sort of uh, poor down and out people and showing how they transformed their lives and showing sort of, uh, you know, those so kind of social documentary started then as well. Very yeah. different with a different remit to, to, to what it is these days, but it was well, there. As you said, it, it's being yeah. used like, like uh, you know, like by, by Kappa and McCullen yeah. um, as a tool to, to show that the, yeah. the real life aspect, you know, the grittiness, you know, what, what we sometimes maybe still associate with documentary photography and, and street photography, you know, how life is, it's unvarnished. And sometimes it's quite compelling, you know, and sometimes it's quite moving and controversial, but yeah. it, it's become a, it comes, becomes a talking point. 
I mean, some painters did that as well in the 19th century. There was, a, it's the way art movements and phot photographic movements did influence each other. So you had, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, you had pictorialism, which was very much in influenced by the Impressionists and post-Impressionists. So, uh, and also the, they experimented very much with the print because the idea, it was aesthetic, you know, photography as an aesthetic, something nice to look at. Uh, so it wasn't, you know, it had to be presented in a way that would work in a gallery. So they'd be framed nicely. They thought about how they presented in the gallery. They used different printing processes. There were a lot of different ways of, of making a print back then, which you can still do now. Mm -hmm. But obviously, they're, they're time consuming. You need the right chemicals. But they weren't all done as gelatin prints. They used gum bichromate printing. They used um, calotypes, which were a different form of calotypes, which were the Fox mm -hmm. Talbot one. But a more modern process was the calotype, which was easier to do. Um, there were cyanotypes. They were all creative printing processes that were mm -hmm. used used to create much more you know sort of painterly images again but in a different way more experimental so they moved away from naturalism and realism to more sort of experimental stuff and then they moved back again because there was everything every movement seems to have a reaction so the reaction to that was this uh, that was um even more sort of hyper reality and abstract photos and movements like uh, the photo secession and the uh there's the what you call an f64 group in america yeah. Yeah. which they they promoted that um idea of photos that were completely sort of as perfect as possible using large you know format plate cameras with yeah. huge amount of detail um and you've had again we'll look at these photographers in more detail in the next podcast mm. uh and along with I don't know. There were so many things going on at that in that period. I'd say in the 1930s, again between the wars, different art, art movements like Dada, Surrealism, Bauhaus—they all fed into photography, and photography then sort of got taken up by artists as well. So you had somebody like Man Ray, who was who was both really he was a photographer and a sculptor and a surrealist and a Dadaist. He dabbled in everything. And it, 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 it's, I think that really, again, that was another really exciting time for photography. Yeah, it is like when there was so much going on. There is, is that element, which still <clears throat> exists today, of mixed media. Um, yeah. you know, as you say, the, the likes of Dada, um, yeah. they're, they're starting to, they're not photographers per se, but they are artists that use photography as yeah. their medium, it lets, you yeah. know, in that sense. So they're, they're bringing in kind of, photo montage collages yeah. you know all yeah. those different things you know yeah. uh, photograms etc that it's all these different variations it really is just they've got this kind of huge pot of different types of art and styles of art yeah. and they're literally yeah, just yeah. kind of throwing it all together to kind of see what comes yeah. out of yeah, it yeah. really and and you know some people when use these in in, in magazine i say magazines yeah. maybe not so kind of early as the early 19th century but as you say coming into um uh, the early 20th century kind of around that war uh first world war second world war advertisements propaganda they're, they're relying on images yeah. Yeah, constantly yeah. so any oh, yeah. way that you can use yeah. photography or as an image to propel somebody to do something becomes very very powerful yes yeah i mean that i think that's when they really really realized the power photography had to influence people and change society and as you say it was used in propaganda a lot mm. uh in europe particularly uh so between the wars you had because of what was going on in europe between the wars there was a lot of propaganda uh, photography used for that uh there was the influence of you know the movements that i mentioned like bauhaus and new new Objectivity. I always get that one wrong. <laughs> Neue Sächlichkeit in German. I'm half oh German, word. so I can say that. <laughs> I'm not even so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're close to it. <laughs> but new objectivity, uh, abstract works, vorticism, futurism, all these kind of things going into that same melting pot. And all those then became very influential in commercial photography, hmm. which was just taking off at that time, I would say. So you had magazines coming out, newspapers. Apparently the first photographic newspaper was i've got a note of it here was the um daily mirror really in 1904 it was the first newspaper to be exclusively illustrated with photos apparently wow I wouldn't yeah have, i wouldn't have i wouldn't uh, have said that you know especially one that's no i had no days. idea yeah and then in the 1920s you had the 
Berliner Illustrierte Zeitung, which was an illustrated magazine. So it was the first illustrated photographic magazine. And then you had Time Life in this country in the 30s, mm. Picture Post. Um, sorry, Time Life was in America in the 30s, Picture Post in this country also in the 30s. So then you had uh, photography becoming so widely seen and available. And uh, a lot of these art influences were then taken up in fashion. So you had fashion magazines like Vogue starting in photog using photography instead of illustration. Um, and all these influences like surrealism and Dada, they all came into advertising and commercial photography as well. So there was a lot of crossover there. And then obviously at the same time, you had more serious publications and uh, I'd say, you know, sort of people like Magnum sort of uh, who were much more their photographers that they were, Magnum was set up as a cooperative um, agency yeah, uh, yeah, in the 1940s, wasn't it? I think that, that's it. Like yeah, it was a, yeah, it would. Um, yeah, it probably would be just kind of, um, yeah, kind of mid, mid war, was it? Yeah. Uh, it, were they early it was, points? It was after the, I think sure I've got to be the exact kind of dates on it, but 1947. Here we go. All right. Okay. So a post-war would make yeah. more sense than yeah. Yeah, yeah. I should say that as things start to kind of as they settle somewhat in Europe. But you, what you were saying about um, fashion photography kind of caught my ear um, because yeah, yeah I, I had a little note about how that. Um, was being used obviously alongside photography for to help kind of designers and, and brands etc kind of accentuate their work and kind of complete the look or the attitude or the concept yeah. that they're trying to get across yeah. but it was then also kind of used further you know, to promote ideas or societal views of gender self-image sexuality sure. and there was a, an art historian uh, uh, Eugenie Schinkel I don't know if you've heard of him yeah um, but he described uh, fashion photography as the fantastic barometer of the time because it yeah. really did depict what was going on um, yeah. in, in everyday life, not, not with the kind of the high societies, et cetera, yeah, but sure. with the man and the woman on the street. Um, yeah. that, that was basically, you know, uh, fashion photography was really the, the marker as to what life was yeah. like at the time. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because also with those sort of picture post magazines and things, people were starting to see images of themselves weren't they mm. sort of in you know in print which had never really happened before uh we've got uh you know street photography and people like Cartier Bresson who was uh I think was he one of the founders of Magnum um yes along with Robert Kappa wasn't it yeah so you had people like that who were going out and just photographing everyday people in the street and that was getting published in magazines so people were beginning to see themselves in print and in pictures whereas before that you'd have only seen you know the famous people mm. uh, that you had uh, like much earlier in Victorian times in cabinet photos which were of famous celebrities like opera singers and politicians yeah. who would then pass out their photos and you'd have your you know official portrait of, of, of the king or whatever you know framed and stuck on the on your mantelpiece and things like that um most people didn't have access to having photos of themselves or ordinary people and then yeah. you know by the 20th century you were seeing all of that and with you know things like box brownies and kind of people were big you know it obviously it wasn't available to everybody but people could you know it was possible to buy a camera and take photos uh of your family and yourself i mean i've got yeah. um i've got a photo album um of it was my grandparents and it was obviously a, a little album of a holiday that they took and it has each page has got like um four little tiny little prints which i think were probably contact prints from some kind of roll film it, it wouldn't have been a, it would have been some sort of english um company that did it and uh, there's pictures of them, pictures of my grandmother posing in a bathing suit, pictures of my granddad fishing, you know, on this holiday somewhere. Um, and there's only ever one of them. In the, so they must have been taking the photos themselves because yeah. there's, no, there's no photos of them both together. It's always either a photo of my granddad or a photo of my grandmother or somebody else uh, or a scene or something like that. So they obviously had a, a the camera that they took with them, had these little prints made and stuck in an album um so it you know but they were you know they they were quite you know reasonably well off sort of middle class people whereas my german side of my family they had photos taken they were farmers they weren't wealthy couldn't afford to you know take but 
apparently there were traveling photographers that used to go around this would have been around the same time sort of 1930s traveling photographers who go around take photos of people in the village and depending on you know how much money you had you could either have you either got the big village photo with everybody in it <laughs> or you could commission you know a family portrait or individual oh. portraits I guess depending on how many photos he wanted to pay for and things like that, they used to come around, set up the dark room tent and everything, take the photos, and then you know you you choose, you choose which ones you wanted. Well, that that's incredible. That's like the the, the yeah. freelance portrait artist, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. becoming you know as a photographer. Because as you were saying before about street photography, um, there that 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 it's always kind of struck my attention as to why people were so excited to see a camera. Um, mm. When you sit, when you look back at like old rolls of film and someone's out filming out on the streets, you know, maybe, maybe it's probably kind of a little bit earlier than the time we're talking about now, but people kind of still want to lean their heads in and they, they want to see what's going on because they've never yeah. seen themselves back apart from yeah. looking into a mirror. As you said, all they'd ever looked yeah. at previously, if they'd yeah. seen a photograph was a celebrity. But now, literally, the camera was coming onto the street, and then you had people like uh, Brassai, uh, and then you go on to like yeah. you know, street photographers like Diane Arbus, and maybe Gary uh, yeah. Yeah, Winogrand, yeah. Um, and they were literally just going out onto the streets of, of New York and other places, and you know, capturing anybody in anything. So it really was kind of quite exciting that you could end up in one of these amazing photographs. Um, but, you know, you wouldn't know it was, it was all kind of quite um, random to some element. Yeah. Really. Well, yeah, yeah. But, but the fact that they were actually willing to reach out and photograph the common man, the common woman, the, the children on the street, and it wasn't mm. celebrities so much or royalty or the upper class that they were chasing anymore. Everything was being pointed more, um, more and more that everybody could be involved one way or another, whether you're being in the photograph or you're, you're taking it. Yes. Um, and also in terms of, uh, you know, I was having a think about when, you know, you're, when people would take their own photos really took off, I would say probably in the, in the sixties. Um, because I remember uh, getting a, this little Instamatic camera then and okay. My grand, father he had a slr but then he was a scientist and a photographer type person he was a hobbyist who who took it more seriously so which was unusual you didn't meet many people who who, who did that whereas in the 60s suddenly um instamatic cameras came out and even kids could have them because they were easy to use so i could use one as a kid and photograph you know and then you know i, I always think about that's probably if I look back through our family albums, the earliest ones tend to be they're black or white pictures that were either taken in a studio, like I've got um, like pictures of me as a baby that are obviously taken in a, in a photographic studio, um, picture, you know, portraits, wedding portraits, things like that, all taken by professional photographers. It's not until you know the sort of maybe the late the fifties when there's a few of my parents that were obviously taking my granddad and then the 60s you start to get more pictures that we obviously took ourselves yeah uh color ones start coming in uh and then as it comes into the 70s there's more and more of them and i think that's the same with most people you get people having their holiday albums holiday snaps by the time it got to the 80s my mum's got you know sort of folders full of holiday snaps that were probably taken on those uh disposable cameras that you could get in the 80s yeah or, or little compact cameras when all those so gradually you know well not gradually i mean it was over quite a you know sort of uh, quite quickly uh it became really accessible so i'd say in the in the 60s and 70s that's when um like what i would call you know social photography in terms of people taking their own photos yeah. documenting their own lives taking photographs from around the christmas tree you know all those kind of things at parties birthday parties suddenly you start seeing loads of photos like that which you've never seen yeah. before well that's it and i think it, it falls in line with what was going on with the world <clears throat> in those years yeah. that kind of around those the 1930s 1940s there were no there's the photographers around but they were capturing the moments that were going on as we were talking about like with war and documentary but 
But as the war stopped, um, obviously a lot of the world was very, very poor, but some countries had benefited and they, they yeah. became, quite, became quite rich. And these big economies, be it um, like, well, say in parts of Western Europe, like the, the United Kingdom and USA, et cetera, mm. those economies became really, really rich um, after the war with, yeah. with a lot of the, the, the payments, et cetera, that they received after. And therefore it affected kind of a lot of society and a lot of um, the people that lived in these countries that they could start to afford these new technologies you know tv at that point for what yep. little there was was all black yeah. and white but come what maybe kind of like the 60s early 60s mid 60s start yeah. to be bringing into color yeah you know color photography was there as well so people could access these i mean they weren't necessarily you know the the, the cheapest thing in the world but because they were being on good wages the economy was quite healthy people were able to invest a little bit more in it and enjoy the luxuries let's say Yes, yeah. And at the same time, I think that's when you really saw the development of commercial photography in a big way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it had always been there right from the start, but I think uh, through the sort of 60s, 70s into the 80s, things like advertising photography, fashion, uh, industrial, corporate photography, social photography in terms of um, uh, like wedding photography, uh, all those kind of things, and social photography in terms of portraits, you know, for ordinary people. So you had like high street studios sort of popping up everywhere um and along with uh shops like jessup's and max spielman where you could go and buy your equipment or get your your, your photos sort of printed and processed it, it it all became much more sort of uh, democratic didn't it in a sense but mm -hmm. at the same time you had this industry i know like um in the 80s i think the 80s was probably the the heyday of uh, commercial photography really in a sense yeah. it's when advertising probably was one of the you know the highest paid jobs you could get as a photographer and yeah. uh, fashion advertising i know when i went to college in the in the early 90s there was this idea that you were going to leave college and you'd go down to london and you'd be earning thousands of pounds a day you know <laughs> to, <laughs> working for some big company or some you know sort of famous magazine you go and work for the face or id yeah. or something i mean i don't think anybody i know ever did but um <laughs> but it was it was weird because that was that was the idea that, you, that people had then it was this you know it was glamorous it was uh it, you know you can make huge amounts of money um and then digital photography came along and it all went completely. <laughs> but I, I think it's a fair totally assumption, changed. really, because like nowadays, you yeah. look at, again, you look to technology, um, you know, like um, web design and, mm -hmm. and things like that as, as yeah. you know, gaming. Though, those are really big industries yeah. going forward because yeah. you know, we're increasingly living in an online world. But even back yeah. then, as you say, you know, advertising, marketing, you could still see it as propaganda to a large degree, but that was being used so heavily because there were so many co uh, companies that were just bringing out new technologies or yeah, toys yeah, yeah. or whatever it is, trying to sell, you know, everything to everybody. So they needed yeah. graphics, they needed images. So to be in that type of industry, mm. you know, around about those years. Um, but was you had to have the knowledge then, didn't you? You had to, um, I mean, you had uh, like, you had Magnum who were like, you didn't have to be uh, what, a trained photographer to join Magnum. You had to be accepted by Magnum uh, to be in their agency uh, for the quality of your images. But you could also get, um, you know, the British Institute of Professional Photography that was set up in this country in 1901. So they've been around for a long time, but they provided professional qualifications. Mm -hmm. So you, you could also qualify as a professional photographer, um, which you didn't necessarily have to be to be a successful photographer. But it was also seen as an important step if you wanted to be a commercial photographer is to get you know go and study yeah. photography um so uh, whereas previously people didn't go and study photography they just did it yeah um uh and well, so that's, a, that's an know, interesting change that people yeah. you know, accepted it more as a, as a recognized um not just yeah. a hobby but um it, it was now going to be a profession that you yeah. could make money out even though people have been making money out of photography for a while but now yeah. there was effectively um a path a career path really for people that they could yeah. go and be a photographer you could be well a... you had to know a lot as well didn't you that mm. because you had to know all about um you had to know about lighting and processing and you know using a light meter using flash uh it, it, it was you know it wasn't <laughs> digital photography tends to do a lot of that for you so it makes it does simplify things and what i found was that 
early on, I'd get, you know, obviously commissioned to take photos because there wasn't anybody else that could do it because I was a photographer. So it was like, well, we need to get a photographer in to do this. Mm -hmm. So you'd get your jobs in that sense. Whereas quite a few of my clients then in the two, early 2000s, got, it got to a point where, well, we don't need you now because we've got a digital camera. Wow. So we can, you know, we don't need a light meter. We don't need this. We don't, need, we didn't, you know, we can figure out how <laughs> to do this really easily. And I, they I were graphic the... designers because they did <laughs> all, right. all the, and the thing is, because they did all the, you know, the after processing. So, you know, I, I think I talked about this before. You'd get your um, transparencies, medium format transparencies scanned, hand them over. Then they do the dig digital work and the processing on them afterwards to, you know, to get what they wanted out of it. But it got to a point where it's like, well, we don't need you to do the original image anymore because we can just get that directly with a digital camera. So yeah. it was, yeah, I know I was things quite a lot. Well, I was going to say, I hope it bit them on the <clears throat> bum, really, in, in the <laughs> nicest way, not, not yeah. only for the sake of the photography industry, but but nowadays, I think even more so another like 20 years or so on yeah. for that, that situation there where we consume images so much and we see it yeah. so often that I think our eyes and our brains are more in tune to, uh, you know, e ever so more with the the level of quality yeah. uh, within an image which you know cameras can deliver a certain level of quality and the better cameras that you've got can you know be that a little bit better but there's still the raw quality needs to be put in you know if you see yeah. the camera as like a, oh, as yeah. a food mixer you've got to put all the levels yeah. the right ingredients in there still and i think now because people are you know we rely on so much on images and video that you've got to be on top of your game yeah. to to make the best so i don't think yeah. you can get away with it so much anymore no i think I, th I, I guess because I was working for creative people anyway, so they were designers, so mm. they, they, they already knew what image they wanted, so quite often it was easy for them to do that themselves because mm. they, they were very image aware and creative people themselves, so that it was easier for them. They didn't have the technical know-how to take photos, but once that was taken away, for, for, you know, then it was easier for them to do it. Yeah. Um, and I think with stock, with stock photography as well, with people yeah. kind of uploading images online yeah. that, you know, were yeah. happy to sign away their yeah. rights for, yeah. for a few pennies, et cetera. It became easy that they could just take an image for free and add text or, you know, crop it however they Well, needed. obviously, yeah, that changed things a lot because um, obviously when you were, I tended to, have, if, if I was working on transparency, I'd be handing over my transparencies to the clients and then mm -hmm. they'd be theirs and I didn't have access to them after no, that. Well, that's, so it. Didn't that's why I don't have a lot of the work that I did <laughs> because it's all gone elsewhere. It belongs to other people. So I've yeah. got all sorts of stuff all over the place that, so, well, that's that I don't there's, have access to. There's a lack of exclusivity yeah. in that part, really. Yeah. That looking Whereas back, now you keep it all. So it's, well, it's that's very it. different. You can, you can share yeah. it to multi-platforms. Someone yeah. can buy a license yeah, yeah. for your image. Somebody yeah. else can have it. But you can still own it as the... Yeah. As the overall yeah. author um, and you can still have the originals as you say but you know and, going back years ago yeah. if you gave away an image you physically gave it away yeah i mean the thing is and there's so much that i mean that, that i don't even know how up to date this is but um apparently with digital cameras smartphones etc there are now several billion photos taken worldwide every day so you think how that's mounting out there are trillions and trillions and trillions of photos yeah there you know on people's computers in their cameras on the internet you know wherever there's so much of it out there we're we're, we're just saturated with images now I, uh, I which we never some... used to be um and this is sorry is that it's good you jump in at that point there i, I yeah. read something again you know how how possible it is to kind of prove this thing i don't know but they said despite the amount of images that are taken like you say you know every day billions and and yeah. obviously over years how many it adds up to there's still not as many photographs that in circulation, past and present, um, as there are, I think it's stars in the universe or planets in the universe oh, wow. or, or, or galaxies. I'm like, basically, yeah, you know, if you kind it's of- kind of mind blowing, isn't it? That's it. You know, if you compare <laughs> the two together, then yeah. apparently, yeah, there is just way more out there in the way of the universe yeah. than there is in terms yeah. of photos on Instagram or yeah. whatever. I imagine yeah, yeah. one day it will, will catch up and level up, but I suppose we don't really know what the universe yeah. is and how big it is. I mean, the goes. thing is now, it, <laughs> I think what's interesting is that um, photography has become something that 
I mean, you can basically do everything that people used to have to have a huge, great um, darkroom and studio and loads of equipment and chemistry and knowledge to do. You can practically, you can do it all on your phone, can't you? Yeah. Because you can have you can have your basics at Lightroom on your smartphone. You can take your photo on the smartphone. You can edit it on the smartphone. You can, you, you know, you can share it. You can upload. It, you can do. You can do it all on your phone. Yeah. You don't actually. You don't even need a camera these days. I mean, it is a camera because it's you know there's a lens and there's the but yeah, know, sensors it's, in there. But, it's all um, in one in effect, and you can yeah. you can take a picture and literally straight away within yeah. you know milliseconds yeah. be showing it to a friend. I remember. You know. uh, <laughs> I remember it uh, when I was studying. They got in. And I now. I need to try and find, I can't remember the name of it, but it was one of the first, it was the first um, computer set up for digital um, imaging. Uh, and they bought one and they installed it and it took a whole room to install the thing. <laughs> it was on racks. The computer was right, yeah. on, on, on these racks. Nobody ever got to use it because it was so difficult to use. Nobody could figure out how it worked. Always. <laughs> so it was there sitting there. And it was, like, oh, when are we going to get to use this, you know, fancy new computer you've got? And it was like, no. well, you know, we, we need to figure out how to use it first. This so I never manual that came with I it. I never had a go with it. And they've been saying to us, oh, it'll be amazing when we get this because, you know, all this sort of, you know dodging and burning and editing that you that you, that you do you know in the dark room we'll be able to do it all on the computer and it's going to be amazing Definitely. it's like we never got a chance to do it Absolutely um, crazy isn't it yeah uh, but yeah but, but I, it, <laughs> so yeah i was gonna say i mean i think it's been so interesting to to see how photography has evolved you know from it being a, yeah. initially a high status uh type of of, of art uh, and then it became, oh, very much became so, yeah. a little bit more kind of to the middle classes and therefore then has has kind of lowered down and spread across the rest of the world but then yeah. also how it was influenced by other art movements that were going on is it not, yeah. not by itself you know it, it took into consideration let's just say like you know kind of painting art sculpture um fashion advertising it, it really is one of these types of art forms that literally meanders between life you know yeah and picks up oh absolutely that's going yeah. on isn't it i mean you've got i mean if you think about the polaroid and i guess initially it was seen as a fairly disposable sort of thing a polaroid uh and then it got picked up on by andy warhol didn't it so you've got pop art comes along andy warhol then just takes polaroid snaps of people but presents them as art and then yeah. suddenly the polaroid is this kind of artistic medium that nobody would have thought it could have been mm. and then you know you move on to there and it's being used in fashion photography and and, and so you've got just one sort of thing like a Polaroid that becomes, you know, almost a phenomenon in itself and has a big influence on other art forms as well. And then yeah. you've got artists picking up on photography and you've got almost, you know, like you had in, in the sort of, was it the 70s and 80s, photographers that were kind of working with photography in the way that just looked like random snapshots but they were actually artists so they were doing it on purpose yeah um and you had those kind of uh very oh what was his name the guy who took all the photos uh he, he actually worked on the world didn't he um originally um, taking photographs of people at new brighton beach and stuff like that martin with parr. flash martin parr yeah. yeah which when first people saw them when he first saw them you thought oh they're just like they're just really bad snapshots they're like something <laughs> <laughs> that somebody would have taken when they're on holiday that didn't, that didn't know how to use a camera <laughs> but then but then he sort of realized well actually no there's much more to them than that yeah and uh i think that's that when the style of photography became popular as well so i think that's when the, the story <clears throat> like with the long yeah. street photography yeah. and, and like documentary in other areas that it, it always gave gravitas the fact that the the image yeah. it photography wasn't just about the um the technical elements of capturing an image but then it became about the content and the context that as you yeah. say martin parr's work I, i've seen other images and you know you, you do start to kind of understand what his his artwork is about yeah. but it is looks very candid and can be yeah. easily overlooked but the more and more that you look at it the relationships the details and, and everything in there as well it's very deliberate and yeah. it, it gave yeah. more credence to the camera as uh, a tool in the same way 
that Rembrandt would use a paintbrush or, or you know, whichever, you know, or mm. I should say like sculptors would use clay. You know, the, the camera was still very, very important, um, but it really kind of the the true essence of the camera, yeah, of yeah, the yeah. photograph came from the photographer, really. So I think it would help more and more uh, that the photographer got, you know, all the, the, the due credits really that they yeah. were, um, that they they kind of put into the image as well, because that's, that's kind of really what makes the art form so interesting. Even these days now, you know, we can tell, I say a bad image, you know, we can speculate over what a bad image is, but an image that's kind of lacking, um, a story is lacking impact and other images that are really, really striking. Mm. You can kind of see those kind of quite clearly. And it's from the likes of, of uh, Diane Arbus and, and Martin Parr that they were able to use a camera to be, you know, to make something very compelling for people for a still image as well, something that they couldn't, um, kind of look behind it wasn't like a sculpture it wasn't a 3d process mm. really you know it wasn't so much like a painting where you could touch it and you could actually feel the brush strokes this yeah. was all very very flat but i think it all came down to the dark room in those instances of how people processed images to create depth and as you're saying using dodging and burning yeah yeah it came very textural in a 2d way there's this constant kind of feedback loop as well isn't there i think in terms of the way like the way we see things is influenced by photography but photography in turn is influenced by the way we see things so it's mm -hmm. it's always sort of going round and round in circles isn't it so yeah, they do and right from the start where you know first of all it was like photography had to imitate art and then it had to be realistic and then it had to be experimental and it had to be this it had to be that constantly changing yeah. uh and influence and, but i think the what, to me what's really interesting is the way I, I do think photography and imaging now I mean it's not just photography is it I mean it's just images have totally changed I think the way people see see the world and even see themselves because they're mm. constantly seeing themselves it's like with the the you know the selfie phenomenon and then all those filters that people put on yeah and how that's influencing people's body image and the way they see themselves or the way they want to look and yeah. you know what what's presented to them as real these days how real is it well that's I mean, it now now you start to question the validity of yeah. the photograph itself that yeah. going back to what we were talking about before with, <clears throat> with Schinkel saying that fashion photography was a good barometer of the time that you can't necessarily trust a camera so well you could trust a camera per se but yeah. then the editing and the editor and the photographer afterwards um yeah. what how much of distortion of life the thing is that the most trustworthy images really were people's snaps weren't they yeah in a sense because they were just snapshots they were candid snapshots so they, they weren't altered they weren't edited I mean, if you, you know, magazine images, you know, if you see portraits of film stars in the 30s, 40s, 50s, okay. all being heavily retouched, they're not what they've, you know, and, and today the same, you know, you see pictures of Madonna heavily retouched. I mean, it, it's like, it's constantly there all the time, but now even people's own pictures, even people's selfies are, are, can be heavily retouched. So yeah. I think it's become less and less, um, I don't know, f although you think of, imaging digital imaging as being hyper real because it's exactly what you see in front of you when you take a digital image once it gets you know sort of processed or you know through photoshop or through a filter there's so, so much can be done to it so easily now that half the time when you're looking at images i'm thinking is that you know is it is it real is it not you just don't know do you i mean some of them obviously aren't real uh yeah. you know if you've got like a, a pig's nose or some bunny ears or something <laughs> it's not going to be it's, real is it it's it getting harder and harder but, you know you hear about yeah. these, these deep fake videos that now some yeah. people have been scammed by by what they see that you, you yeah. literally get into the point now and i think there's maybe something that goes on in the future and you know this is maybe yeah. a, another discussion for us another time yeah. that you can't trust your eyes so much anymore as no, well, which is kind of scary, quite really. worrying that people have manipulated things like photography and video, you know, for, for nefarious ways, really. But um, but I think that's been a, a brilliant discussion overall. I, I think we've uh, we've kind of pulled up a lot of uh, interesting facts and, and discussed kind of how, you know, how photography has changed over the years. But, you know, if you've been watching or you've been listening and you've got any kind of further points to make any of the facts that we may have missed out or anything you'd like to add, then I think, you know, definitely get in touch because we've never next week we're moving on to um still working on the, the history of photography but on a, a different point of view aren't we yes uh it's it's really we've mentioned a lot of 
movements in photography, different types of photography, commercial, industrial, fashion, whatever. So uh, next week, we're going to actually just talk about some of the actual uh, influential photographers over the years that have sort of shaped what photography is. I'm not, I'm not don't even know if they've shaped what photography is these days because it's such a different thing, but have been very influential in the development of photography and what, you know, how we see photography, I guess, and how we see the world. Indeed. So make sure you uh, tune in for that next show. Um, then you can kind of find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere that you kind of pick up podcasts these days, we should be around. Um, and also as we've got a video version of these podcasts as well, you can find us on YouTube. Uh, but Nick, I just want to say thank you so much for, for coming along again today day with all your art no history it's been fantastic and very very yeah, been, revealing as well isn't it cool yeah it's been interesting uh, i like I, I like the way we're doing it as a discussion thing rather than just you know coming out with a timeline and a load of dry facts i think it makes it more interesting because you yeah. can go off at you go off at tangents and think oh yeah that's an interesting idea and then oh, that so yeah definitely. i've got tons of notes i haven't even got through it you know with well yeah i know you I, can take I, too I many <laughs> Well, that's it. <laughs> Listen, it you never difficult. know where your discussion is <clears throat> going to go, but I've, I've got information. You know, well, what would be ears. nice? Yeah, what would be good is if if there's things that people pick up from these po podcasts that can then sort of, if they're interested, can go and look into yeah. uh, and take further. And maybe I'm just thinking, you know, it might be nice if we if we maybe got together a timeline and some notes and actually sort of put it up there for people to refer to. Yeah. Uh, and obviously it's difficult without, if you're listening to it, it's difficult without images. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, you, it's picking up on some of the names and things and looking them up. It's so yeah. easy to Google things these days. So, oh, that, you know. It. That well, that's it. Because in, in next week's show, we'll hopefully be kind yeah. of divulging a little bit more bios about the people, some of the people that we, we've spoke about, and, and some yeah. others that we haven't so far as well that have been influential in, you know, what we see as photography these days, or what we, we saw as photography years ago as well. But in the meantime, again, thank you very, very much, Nick. Thank you so much for for joining us. Whether you're watching this on the video or still listening on the podcast, um, and if you are, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, we really appreciate if you get the opportunity to leave a review and a little rating for the podcast. That really, really helps us out in terms of where we appear on your internet uh, but thank you so much for in the meantime as well and we'll catch you in the next show bye bye for yeah. now bye bye <laughs>